Country Talk Radio. You're in to all things music. Welcome to Jackie's Groove. Come journey with us through the rhythm of the music business with your host, Jackie Bertoni. Jackie's Groove, and uh, brought to you by Intertalk Radio Networks. We're a day after the amazing debut of this amazing rock documentary, which we've been very, very blessed to be part of, called The Hired Gun. And their tagline has been, out of the shadows and into the spotlight. Something that we've always been proud of here at Jackie's Groove, to celebrate the hired guns, the assassins, the hired grunts, as I call them, the gentlemen and, uh, and ladies below the marquee that support the names above the marquee, and unfortunately unsung and not celebrated. So with this situation and with my show and with the hired gun, we're going to, pay, we're going to flip that script. We're going, to bring the, we're going to bring the people that make the music for the big people even that much more special. So with that said, I want everybody to welcome with open arms and open ears to Jackie's Groove, original guitar player from Billy Joel's band from 1976 to 1989. That's a long time. So with that said, I want everybody to welcome with open arms and open ears to Jackie's Groove, Mr. Russell Javers. Russell, welcome, my friend. Hey, Jackie. Good to be here. Hey, man, it's good to have you. Man, I got to tell you, I viewed the hired gun five times in my studio. And uh, uh-huh. I had to make the pilgrimage to the theater to see it. And I got to tell you, it was amazing. Just that whole vibe of having... You know, that 70,000 watts of Skywalker Ranch putting that music together. And for those of mm-hmm. you listening here, and those who are listening on the archive, what we'll do in about another uh, few hours, please wait and search out this amazing documentary, which Friend Strine, the director, stated the fact that, um, fingers crossed, it will be at HBO and we'll be going to, on the Netflix. Uh, search it. Search the, the documentary trailer on YouTube. And also go to fathomevents.com slash hired gun. Search it. Look for the trailer. Be amazed. So with that, Russell, you came into this amazing world called, uh, I don't know if we want to use the word amazing, um, back in um, June, was it June 16th? June 13th. June 13th, in, uh, Friday the 13th. Yeah. Yes, man. And in and, and Brooklyn, New York, another Brooklynite here. And uh, so when you yeah. started with that, we'll get into the crux of the hired gun. But let's kind of touch base on Russell Javers. You know your your your, your longevity, everything that was uh, encompassing you in the Javers household. What were your inspirations, my friend? What were you listening to? What was that? What was the family listening to as you grew up that put you towards the uh, the area of harmonica and guitar? Well, it's funny because my my folks loved music, so there was there was Ray Charles in the house, there was Nat Cole in the house, but there was. Uh, Elvis and, and everything else. So it, it, it was a lot of different stuff, but a lot of standards. Um, but it's so funny when I met all these other musicians in this movie, it seems like we all had the epiphany on the same day. That Sunday night when the Beatles were on at Sullivan, I can't tell you how many lives that changed. You know, we, the second I saw that, I know for Liv, it was the same thing too. That's what I want to do. I think it was the same thing for Billy as well. And I saw that, and, and that's it. That's what I want to do. And tried to model myself after that, too. So, I, you know, I, 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 the art of playing rhythm guitar in a band and not being, you know, a, a super player or anything, it's all about the song. So, to me, I always aspired to do it and try to do it as the way John would do it, you know. So that, right. was, that was my inspiration, and that was my focus. You know, it was crazy, Russell, because of everybody I've I've interviewed in the last year and a half, it seems that probably 98% of the people that we talk to, I've spoken to, 
were inspired by the mm-hmm. Beatles on Ed Sullivan, myself. I mean, I remember that as a young kid watching uh-huh. that situation. And um, it's amazing how that stuck with everybody and how everybody wanted to emulate being, um, you know, the John Lennons and the Paul McCartney's and Ringo Starr's and the, and, the, uh, and the Harrison's, you know. But the fact of the matter is you developed your own sound as you grew up because, you know, being an East Coast guy, a Brooklyn, a Brooklynite, you know, the there was such a melding and such a, uh, a mold of different types of music. I don't care if it's Latin, R&B, rock and roll and so on. Did you know that this was the style of music that you were going to be most apt to playing? Or did you dabble in different uh, genres of music? Well, 100% it was, you know, that's what the inspiration was. And the more primitive it was, the more I liked it. I never, and and it's funny, to me there was magic on so many of those records when I was growing up. And I mm-hmm. remember, what you know, a new Beatle record would come out and we'd have the transistor radios and we'd have them under our pillow and listen, it would come on uh, right. ABC and WINS and I'd listen all night because every hour on the hour. I'd get to hear it again. And those like magic times where you go to Jones Beach and everybody had their radio tuned to the same station and the song would come out and then be cranked and you'd hear it all the way across the beach. So to me, it was magic on those records. And I guess I'm an oddball because I didn't want to learn those note for note and take the magic away. I wanted to right. kind of interpret it my own way. And, and and see if I could get that feeling. But, you know, so I never really would sit there and really try to learn all the parts the way they played them. Which I, I don't know why, but that's just how I was. It, you know, it worked for you, man. And, you know, and was, was guitar the main instrument you went to? Because I know that your other parts are obviously background vocals and also harmonica. I have, um, I think I've heard maybe on the Lords of 52nd Street, we'll, we'll touch uh, lightly on this also. Um, but how much of the mm-hmm. harp is in your music? Like zero because I, I, I'm kind. Of, it's so funny. Uh, we, I'm, on one of our tours with Billy, we we toured and took Stillman set in with us, and I know just a couple of things on the harmonica, and uh, you know, and but I do them in the show, but but that's it. And Toots would be on the side of the stage, and he's like, the, he was the greatest, you know. And I'd look at him and I go, I'm really sorry, right. but you know, I got to do my thing here, but. Um, it, you know, it started early. I started more as a songwriter. I started writing. and That's kind of how the band initially got together. Is the idea was to do our own thing the way we wanted to do it, make it song based. Right. And you know that that was really the germ of of how we all got together, and and really learned how to play with each other and and make some sparks happen. And it was always about songs, and it was always about the best way to frame the song. So it was really never about, you know, what can I do to, to show off here? It was exactly. always how we frame these songs the best. And, you know, and Russell, which I think was a real benefit when we got with Billy, because then we had a, a collective mindset when we went in there and everybody approached it pretty much the same way. And, and let's step back for a second before Billy, let's talk about Topper and your bandmates, mm-hmm. Liberty DeVito and Doug Stagmar, God rest his soul and Howard Emerson. Yeah. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it's amazing. And when you think about that situation, how could it not be a conducive unit when you guys all breathe in unison and to take that mm-hmm. unit, you know, that unit of Topper and to have it meld over into the Billy Joel band. And I got to tell you, I've been a fan of Billy's for years, you know, and um, mm-hmm. I got I to gotta be very honest with you. Um, I was very disillusioned with him um, prior to knowing the backstory of the hired gun. And a lot of the stuff that was put on there, you know, and, and being close with Lib and so on. I, I just want to know mm-hmm. you of another voice because I, you know, I had my interview with Richie Kanata, amazing saxophonist. Uh-huh. And it, it, mm-hmm. it, I got to tell you, man, you, you you brought a tear out of my eye, especially last night when you talked about the demise of Doug. And, you know, well, that I don't yeah, I don't want to bring up sad stories here, but um it, that was crazy. You can only imagine the stories. Again, kids, no spoiler alert. But when you see this movie, you understand what I'm saying. You're mm-hmm. still struggling with this, my friend. Is is this still a very empty part of your oh. life with uh, Doug gone? Oh, 100%. That was probably one of the most profound um, things that ever happened to me in my life. It's Doug and I were, you know, well, Doug, Liv, and I were like brothers. But Doug and my wife and I, you know, Doug, Suzanne, and I, we shared a house before we got married. Wow. Um with what little money I got for 
um, my wedding, we had no furniture. We went out and we bought a, a four-track tape recorder, and that's what was in the living room that we would sit around and play. You know, it, it, it was always that type of thing. Mm-hmm. And uh, so Doug was one of my dearest friends. Um, and, you know, I've been reading some negative stuff about, you know, with us, it's sour grapes and this and that. You know something? I did this movie because I felt it was celebrating guys like me and Doug and like Liv and like Richie. And, you know, so it was a celebration of us and, and what we did and what, you know, nobody's out to trash anybody, but if somebody asks you a question, you answer the question honestly. Of course. And so, so, so the thing, uh, you know, Billy has a right to hire and fire whoever he wants. It was just after 13 years and the story I told him, it's a story Billy, you know, mentioned himself is that after 13 years, I had no idea, you know, I was blindsided. I'm driving around one day in the car, and I hear that he's got a new album and a new band. That's how I found out. So, wow. you know, once I mean, again, it's, the, you know, I was grateful for all the years that I was there. Those were the best years. Those, you know, I loved every day. He had 100% of my loyalty, 100% of my respect. But it just ended kind of ugly, and, and it was, I just, to this day, I don't understand. Like I said, he's not married to me. He doesn't have to keep me around. It's just the way it happened was, you know, and I don't know how that comes across in the film. Like I said, it's not, it is what it Harsh. is. You know, you do a gig and, and you know, but, you know, so, so that's my take on it. I'm not, you know, it, 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 I didn't go into this to do this as a trash belly thing, but, you know, no, 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 no. at the end of I, the day, it is what it is. You know, it's, it, it's, the thing with Doug was the toughest one. And, uh, you know, I have, I was married. I, I had a wife and kid and, and, you know, so my life was set with or without Billy. That didn't define me. With Doug, it, it kind of took one step backwards and another step back and another step back. And we, even though we talked and we, we, um, we stayed in touch and I knew he was depressed, but I didn't know how depressed and Right. And that no, no one ever to does. This day because, you know, yeah. So, so here's a weird story. And, and, um, I had called Doug. I hadn't seen him in a while. I got involved in other projects, other things. I kind of reinvented myself a couple of times and I called up Doug and I, and I tell him he was a little down. I said, Doug, listen, I'm going to fly in. Let's get together. Let's, uh, I've got this germ of a song and let's remember what we used to do. Let's get together. Let's record this song. And, you know, it'll have, like, have half the lyrics, but um, let's just, you know, we'll finish it off in the studio. And he said, great, let's do it. And then all of a sudden his, uh, he, the guy that worked with him in the studio, this guy, John, but he used to call him Cato. And he said, uh, so Cato calls me and says, um, you know, Doug has to cancel, called again, canceled again. So, and then the next call I got was my buddy told me he was gone. But uh, I never finished the song. And then later I came out and all the lyrics didn't change the lyric, but it wound up that the song was about Doug. And 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 I re- I only just finished up the lyrics, but they were all about him. And that's, you know, one of the songs, it was a song called Best of Me. And never finished it. It was just you know, me and a drum loop, you know, just and uh, but that was it wound up being about Doug. And that's like, oh, man. Um, so he's still a part of my psyche, a part of my mind. The things we're doing with the Lords, the bass player that we use, who's, tr- who's terrific. But he plays Doug's bass when he. Yeah, I know that that's what us. blew me out of the water. I mean, that and that brings uh-huh. that whole vibe itself. You know, think about this for a second. You guys come out of Topper. And Topper mm-hmm. becomes Billy Joel's band. You guys denied well, the it fact that Billy with Liv and Doug first. I mean, honestly, Liv and Doug were the first ones in. They did half the album just with the three of them, and then Harry okay. and I came in. So well, it, 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 it evolved to be that you know to be what we were. But once we were all together and on the road and everything, it was you know it was that mindset. The fact that we we all had a lot of laughs together. We were like brothers, all of us. So, uh, and I think that joy of being together, that collective mindset, all of that reads on those records and on those tours. And, you know, everybody could have been, a, you know, Doug and Liv and, 
and Howie, you know, Howie's an amazing guitar player. And then later David Brown, another brilliant guitar player. I was really blessed to play with such great guys, but they could have all been stars in their own situations all by themselves. But collectively, we just had a little something extra that really added to the, uh, you know, to the mix, you know, so, and then Phil Ramon was the wild card. My God, you know, sure. working with Phil was the, was one of the greatest experiences I ever had. Well, I think so. it's pretty amazing. You guys come out of, um, come out of the top of vein and you guys go into the Billy Joe band and then you come up with this amazing historical album called turnstiles. And, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, you talk about, you know, again, the Cinderella story itself. I mean, do you still think about that, that time when you heard yourself on the radio first with Billy's music and turnstiles, was that, the first and most prolific aha moment in Russell's life? Um, I, I guess so. When, you know, it, what was weird is like, we couldn't get arrested around the time of church. So we were open up for the beach boys. We, you know, right. we go to Australia and we have like a number one record in Australia. And it's like, Whoa, this is pretty good. You know, this, you know, this, you know, this thing is going to be fine, you know, but, but we were still struggling like hell in, in the, in the States. And, and you could see there were pockets where it was starting to take hold and, 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 and watching Billy in those days, watching him really perfect his craft. I mean, it, and, and he worked hard at it. You know, he, he'd have a patter between songs and, and if a line kind of sat there. He would polish it and try it the next night until it started really getting smooth. And he, and he worked really hard to do it. We all had the eye of the tiger going out there and you know, a lot of people didn't like when we opened up for him because, you know, we, you know, really pull it up. But Billy could turn an arena into a living room. And, you know, and it was really fun to be a part of that and to, right. uh, you know, it was cool. I mean, you know, I, I can't say anything else about it. it, was, it, it and it, Russell, what it, we can say right time. now. As we're coming out of segment number one, you see how fast these segments go. Sure. When we pick it up on segment number two, I want to get back into the situation with the higher gun and who approached you and sure. uh, and as if you had any trepidations at all talking about that. And, uh, and the sure. listeners want to know that. Your fans want to know that. So with that said, guys, I want everybody again to welcome with open arms Mr. Russell Javers. Russell, I'm a big fan of yours, man. I have been for for years. Oh, and you. I got to tell you, um, I want to find out more, too, when we get back about the situation. Uh, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Were you in the big Russia concert with Billy? Were you? Was that your uh, your timeline with Billy? Oh at, yeah. Uh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. I want to touch. I want to touch more about that because a lot of the fans want to know about that situation. So when we come back on segment number two, Jackie's groove, Jackie Bertoni with Mr. Russell Javers here on uh, the InterTalk Network. So guys, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after a short message. You don't want to miss a thing. Stay tuned. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Hi, I'm Tim Dolbear, the host of Sound Experience on Intertalk Radio. Each week, I talk with top professional audio engineers, producers, musicians, and the manufacturers that make the tools that we use in the studio each and every day. From capturing the perfect take to mastering your final release and the tools and how the pros use them, we are going to dive deep into their process and learn from their experience. I look forward to you joining us each week on Sound Experience with me, your host, Tim Dolbear. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. 
Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on entertalkradio.com. Hey, it's Carney Wilson, and you're listening to Jackie's Groove with Jackie Bertone. <laughs> Jackie's Groove. Come journey with us through the rhythm of the music business with your host, Jackie Bertoni. Welcome back to Jackie's Groove. This is Jackie Bertoni, brought to you by Undertalk Radio Network. You're into all things music. Hey, guys, if you can't listen to us live, um, do yourselves a favor and do us a favor and visit iTunes or Google Play and download our easy-to-use and easy-to-navigate application. Two words. First one, Intertalk. Second one, Radio. Uh, download this free app. It's amazing. And you can take Jackie's Groove and the plethora of shows on our network with you when you can't listen to us live. And speaking of live, I'm live and in living color today with... The amazing guitarist, sweet man, I got to tell you, uh, my now my new brother from the other mother, as they say, Mr. Russell Jabbers from <laughs> Billy Joel's band, Lords of 52nd Street and Topper. Welcome back, my brother. You know, and I, and I oh. wanted to say something uh, real quick to you. Uh, one of my very dear friends, uh, an amazing um, uh, music photographer by the name of Michael Lynn Jr., uh, Michael introduced me sure. to Richie, and um, he wanted me to ask you, um, you know, uh, did you ever get a chance to see the black and white isolated photos of uh, of you that Lib put up on the Lords of 52nd Street Facebook page? And if you no. haven't, he said, he said, definitely do it. And he said, um, make sure that afterwards I'll message you and he wants to send you some of these photos. I mean, they're amazing. They'll be beautiful cool. for your studio and your wall. And uh, so I wanted to make sure I threw the shout out there. Hey, um, Russell, that song we came in on the top of the second uh, set to the listening audience out there. That wasn't Crosby, Stills, Nash. Talk to me about the genesis of that tune. That was beautiful. Well, that's the one I was telling you about. With uh, that's the one about Doug, um, oh, and Jesus. that's the one that I had called him to start uh, to to see if we could get together, and we never did get together. So that's just a, a demo, a drum loop, and a guitar and a, and a couple of harmonies. But you know, and I couldn't get myself to finish it because Doug wasn't there, you know, to finish yeah. the track, but. I thought it was interesting because originally Fran was going to put that in the movie mm-hmm. and I don't know, you know, I, um, it didn't wind up getting in there, but, um, uh, uh so I, I just, you know, thought, you know, in talking about Doug, that, 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 you know, that was maybe something interesting, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, that's cool. Let me that's ask you, let me ask you an honest question and, and give me an honest answer, please. Um, talking sure. to Lib and, you know, on air, off air, just, you know, shooting the shit about food and everything else. And in the restaurant, he's going to take mm-hmm. his two called Cataldo's. I'm sure you know that wonderful place in Brooklyn. Um, and so and we're going to talk about this, but I want to know something. Billy calls you up tomorrow mm-hmm. and you guys, you guys shoot the shit and everything else and not looking for an apology or whatever mm-hmm. it was. Cause as they said before, Billy never fires anybody. He just never asks you back, which is you know, is, is as ambiguous and vague as you possibly can get with anybody. But he asked you to mm-hmm. come back. He asked Liberty to come back, because I know Liberty said he'd come back in a heartbeat. Would Russell come back? Would there be any, would there be a half beat in your answer, or would you say yes immediately? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, and honestly, I don't know, because I, A, I don't think it's going to happen. Right. And, you know, even if it did, I you know, it's it, it would never be like it was unless Billy decided to start making music again. Yeah, he's like in a different place. I don't think that world is the same world that we were in. And he has a right to, you know, I mean, he's gone through his cycle and done what he's done, and he's earned the right to do whatever the hell he wants. But I just can't imagine, you know, playing, you know, (laughs) it, it, it would be like us sitting in with that band. You know, they're doing their version of our arrangements, and it would be hard to follow, you know, them doing our arrangements. You know, it's like 
third generation. I don't see how yeah, it could but, work, you know. And, but, Rush, you know what, though, man? Let me think. This tells me, you know, I when you guys left the band, I'm going to use that term when you left the band. You can't fire me because I quit. But that situation is you took a vibe with you guys. I mean, no, no, uh, not to despair, it would be disparaging to the young guys that are, you know, filled your shoes or tried to fill your shoes. Billy lost a lot of that vibe. I mean, I'm sorry. I mean, I've looked at, you know, current videos and then videos that you, uh, uh, you guys mm-hmm. made famous. Um, I, I don't know, man. I, I, I think in my personal opinion, as a, a musician myself and as a noble player, I think if Billy wants to go on with the music business and become relevant again, I hate to use that term because I don't know if he's not relevant. Uh, he's still selling out arenas, but I think the People only way still is, love him. Yeah, well, you know, and I and, and there's no doubt. I mean, but the fact of the matter is, you know, not everybody who went to a Billy Joel concert went to a Billy Joel concert to see Billy Joel. And a lot of lot of hardcore well, fans uh, go there because our, of the musicians. Fans, for sure. Well, you know, here, and here's the way I look at it. it go like, ahead. You know, it's funny that. Like Bill, you know, people that come to see the Lord say we sound more like the record than Billy does. Well, that's because we're playing them in the original keys, and everybody, as you get older, changes. David Bowie did, and you know, so Billy's register is a little bit lower now. So when you play those old songs, they're not going to sound exactly the same way. But if mm-hmm. it were me, and and I've said this to to some of Billy's people too, and it's out of respect to me if I was over there. And I think if we were all there, I'd love to see a batch of songs that embrace this lower register. Um, and David Bowie did it with some of the best stuff, you know, the Left Stands album. It was some of the best stuff of his career. So to me, as a musician, I'd love to hear, you know, with all the experience, everything else that he's gone through, how cool would it be to hear a batch of songs that embrace this version of Billy, not a, you know, a Sinatra-esque you know, sure. type of thing, you know, he did some quotes. But, you know, to me, it would be a pop record and something really cool. I mean, my dream with Billy was always to do a Rubber Soul type album, a little bit stripped Absolutely. down. And with all those kind of influences, we touched it on a couple of things. But how cool would it be to hear a more mature, but with that same pop sensibility? That would be the record I would love to make. I have no idea what he would love, you know, to do. But if there was something like that, where we could do a project like that, I would do it in a heartbeat. Um, you know, you, and, and I don't and think I could, that's going to happen for a lot of reasons. Never say never, and you know the reasons, the inner mechanics of this. But you know, um, and for those who are not familiar with the Lords of Fifty Second Street, and please visit that website, the Lords of Fifty Second Street dot com. If you, and this is my analogy, Russell, and stop me if I'm out of line here. But you know, I know, mm-hmm. you know, um, the third generation of Earth, Wind, and Fire, the current band that's touring right mm-hmm. now. I've got friends of mine that have been in the band for fourteen plus years. But Earth, Wind, and Fire of today is not the Earth, Wind, and Fire of the Al McKay days, where it was the raw mm-hmm. band. It was the Maurice White band and so on. Um, Billy Joel mm-hmm. band today is not the Billy Joel band, in my humble opinion. But with that said, if you guys want and are striving, the hardcore Billy Joel fans, the old guys like Russell and myself that want to be influenced and, and to be overdosed by sound— this lead singer, the keyboardist with the Lords of 52nd Street, I don't know if this mm. man channeled, and I think his name is Doug, too, also. Correct me if I'm wrong? Dave Clark. Dave Clark. That's right. Okay. Not so, Dave, and, not the, yeah, glad all over Dave Clark, but Dave Clark. Yeah, man. Let me tell you, this man sounds like Billy Joel in Billy's heyday. And uh, so if you want to go back really and— doing an invitation. That's just what No, he not at like. all. You know, not at all. Yeah, he's, you know— because I don't think it would work if we were doing, we're not a tribute band. We, you know, right. we're the guys that made those records, and we don't want to do a show that's like a tribute band. We want to play those songs with the same energy and the same enthusiasm and the same mindset that we brought you know, to the other stuff. So what we do is total respect to that material, mm-hmm. and Dave does it too. He has the right attitude in doing it, so it's been a pleasure working with him. You know, and, 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 let me, and let's jump back for one second. Let's go back to what we are talking about today and the reason for Russell being on the show today. Russell, who approached you for the hired gun? Who approached you and asked you to be part or be a signature part of this uh, of this documentary? <laughs> it's kind of funny. I was at the emergency room with my mother-in-law, and I get a call from Fran, who lived, had given him my number. And Fran was looking to get, you know, some other perspective on some of the stuff that lived. 
you know, some of the stories Lib was telling, because he was, mm -hmm. you know, filming Lib for a couple of years. Um, and my first reaction was, wow, this is, you know, kind of about Lib. And I, you know, I, I was happy to do anything that Lib and Fran wanted me to do, but I didn't know that it would be right for me to do it. I didn't want to kind of horn in on Lib's parade, you know. So, uh, mm -hmm. but Fran was talking to me. I said, well, who's in the, you know, who else are you talking to? And he said, well, Jay Graydon. I said, oh, did you do, uh, um, you know, did, did he talk about Tay? He goes, yeah. I said, well, guess what? I was literally, you know, less than 10 feet away from him when he did that solo. I was happened to have been at that session. Were you and, really? Uh, he goes, oh, oh absolutely. So, and, and it's funny, Jay and I are going back and forth on that now because, you know, he was so zoned in, he didn't know, but I was there with a guy named Ronnie Vance that, um, who, who, who signed me to my first publishing deal way before Billy. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and, and he was close and his brother was, uh, Kenny Vance of Jay and the Americans. And, uh, so, so there was a connection there between Becker and Fagan. So right. I, I went to a bunch of Steely Dan sessions, but I just happened to be there when Jay was doing the solo and it was like, oh my God, I was telling everybody, you're not going to believe what I just heard and the way it went down. And, you know, Jay, Jay's memory is a little sketchy. So, you know, we, we're trying to recreate the details. It's been, you know, it's funny. It was such a thrill to meet Jay because I've, I've so long admired his work. And it was, it was so cool to meet so many of these people in this film. But anyway, so Fran called me and, and was asking my perspective. And he said, that's it. I'm sending a film crew. And he sent the film crew to Florida to, uh, you know, to take an interview. And, uh you know, so, so that's how it came about. Uh, and then as he was talking about Topper, I, you know, I, I gave him a couple of the Topper demos and one of the songs, it was just, the, the Topper tapes never came out. A, they were never finished except for one or two songs, but the the engineer and the studio was the same one we did Turnstiles and, mm -hmm. and the engineer who recorded it held the tapes for me and he held them at his house along with some of the Billy stuff and, and, and other stuff. And long story short, he gets divorced and his wife destroyed all the tapes. Right. They're gone. So all I have is lousy cassette versions of all that stuff and, and, and we never did anything with it. So You know, I, and, and I got to ask a question to you because a lot of uh, listeners are asking this itself. Uh, could be an unfair question. Mm -hmm. Let's just go through the uh, chronology here. Let's start out with Turnstiles, 52nd Street, Glass mm -hmm. Houses, Songs of the Attic, The Nylon mm -hmm. Curtain, An Innocent Man, Mm -hmm. Greatest Hits Volume 1 and 2, The Bridge, um, Cole, um, was it, uh, how do you say it, K-H, uh, K-O-H-L? Uh, Life Cole from Hits. Leningrad. Okay, perfect. And then also Greatest Hits Volume 3. <laughs> Unfair question, uh -huh. honest answer. Yep. What's your favorite album out of all those? Oh, jeez. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I like songs from each one of them. Okay. So, um. I don't know. Um, maybe okay. glass houses, maybe uh, turnstiles or glass houses. I didn't play on the Stranger. I did the Stranger tour uh, at the at the time. That was when we were doing the Topper stuff. Billy sat in on some of my stuff. I did the tour, but I didn't play on the Stranger. I did, and I did a little bit of Fifty Second Street, <clears throat> but then everything else. But I did all those tours. Um, you know, and and Russell, when you would walk on oh, these stages, yeah. Okay, I'm going to go here because I want to stay on this thing. When you walked onto the stages, with all of this, 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 this mass of hits. But when you walked on mm. stage with Billy, when you guys walked in on this unit itself, did did Russell ever say to himself, "Ah, oh, shit, we're going to play this song again because it's on the set list"? Was there that shit song that if you never played again, that you'd be cool with that, or did you enjoy every? Oh yeah, there was a couple of them. In, in okay. fact. We all, in fact, we all had phony names for the hotels, and my phony name was Otis Boring, and which was for, short for Otis Boring Song or Otis Boring Flight or Otis right. Boring, you know, whatever. So, so but so I was I was Otis, and uh, so there were a couple of songs I really didn't like playing, and you know, one of them, you know, I guess Piano Man was was one of them. It's, you know, so mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a great song, but it was just you know not the greatest one to play live. Right. Um, I, I wasn't wild about things like um, root beer rag and, and traveling prayer and mm -hmm. uh, wasn't really that wild about Captain Jack. Um, but 
that being said, you know, every night there there was something else. There was so many songs that I that were just amazing. You know, my favorite Philly song, I guess, is Vienna. Um, Boy. which it kind of had like a topper. It, well, first it, it had a groove that we were that we were doing in one of the topper songs. Boom, uh, you know, boom. Wow, and it kind of, and I kind of felt that there was a, a little inspiration there from the way we attacked a couple songs on on the sessions we were doing, and that Billy sat in on. <laughs> Excuse me, um, but the, the song was uh, was just you know it, it, it's concise. The, the The thing about Billy is that he is such a chameleon. Like he'll write a song, like he'll do Baby Grand, but he'll do it like a Ray Charles imitation. I like the songs better when. I can hear Billy jump out of those tracks. And Vienna was one of those songs. She's Always a Woman is one, or one of those songs. Um, a lot of turnstiles reminded me, uh, you know, it, it was like I could see Billy coming off those tracks. So I, I, I'm, like Uptown Girl, there was a, a demo of it, and it was a great record. But I think one of the rough, you know, one of the early rough vocals didn't do the Frankie Valley voice. That was the number one record. Don't get me wrong. So, you know, but I liked it better as the, the Billy voice. So, you know, Elton always sounds like Elton. Billy kind of molds into characters when he, when he writes and when he plays, you know, it's, you know, he'd probably tell you the same thing, but the ones where a, a song that I always loved of his, which is a short little thing called souvenir. Love that. Um, you know, it's it, there's a lot of his songs really, really connect. And then you have, uh, you know, scenes from the Italian restaurant. And they're kind of My like uh, Abbey Road type songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's you know, just, uh, just, just being that consummate Italian, when I hear that song, the bottle of red and a bottle of white, if that doesn't paint a mm -hmm. picture of just sitting around, you know, and that's the best place because, you know, Russell, you know, us Italians, we're all about food. Everything about our life. When we're having breakfast, we're talking about lunch. And when we're talking about lunch, we're having figuring where we're going to have for dinner. And, you know, and, and it seems like, you know, with you and all the guys itself, I want to get back to that situation of, um, and the listeners want to know, too, when you guys traveled and so on and so forth, and how conducive were the four of you? And then it became the three of you and so on. Um, I want to know also, there's a lot of questions and stuff, because the bottom line, as much as you... I don't want to say the word that you don't want to be associated with that situation, but Billy Joel will always be part of your DNA. I mean, there's no way you're going to escape from that. And you 100%. know that, it's, you know, and, it's like playing on and the why game. would, you know, it's like, you know, yeah. hold that thought brother. Cause we're coming out of uh, this segment here. The, the bumper music's coming up. You guys don't go anywhere. This is Jackie for Tony with Jackie's groove with my in-studio guest, Mr. Uh, Russell Jabbers. Um, God, I'm having a great time. A thousand questions, Russell. Shame on you for only taking an hour this time out. So with that said, come back on segment number three with Mr. Russell Jobbers from the Billy Joel Band and Topper and Lord's 52nd Street. Hi, Don't this is Tim anywhere. Dolbear, host of Sound Experience here on Intertalk Radio. And Source Connect by Source Element is the essential tool that we use to link between my studio in Austin, Texas and the WS radio station in San Diego. Now with Source Connect, not only can we communicate in real time and with HD audio, but it's synced up and is of a high enough quality that I can use it for real-time ADR work, remote recording and overdubbing, and it even allows me to remotely control a DAW. Source Connect by Source Element, affordable, high-quality audio and video connection over the Internet for all of your production needs. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Make this your vinyl night. I'm John J.R. Robinson, and every week, music creation comes alive through stories, experiences, and sounds when vinyl records filled our hearts and minds. My friends and I share our tips and techniques used in creation of iconic tracks for recording artists such as Michael Jackson, Eric Clapton, Quincy Jones, and Steve Winwood, to name a few. Vinyl has emerged hot, and the soul of vinyl defines art and passion, which burns deepest at night. Tune in every Wednesday at 2 p.m. Pacific Standard Time on EnterTalkRadio.com. 
Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. Hi, this is Shelly Sondheim, President and CEO of CSM Words and Music. You're listening to Jackie's Groove with Jackie Bertone. <laughs> Come journey with us through the rhythm of the music business with your host, Jackie Bertoni. Welcome back to the last segment of a one-hour interview with the iconic guitarist, Mr. Russell Javers from Billy Joel's band from Lord's 52nd Street, and it all started with the group called Topper. Hey, you know, Russell, I have to ask you this question, my brother. You know, you mentioned it a little while ago, and if I, and if I answered the question or sloughed over it, are you a father? Oh, yeah. Um, my son, Jesse, uh, lives in Knoxville. He, he's 40 years. He was in Russia with us as was uh, Tori and Alexa. And, uh, yeah, Jesse's... I, I, I've got two grandsons, Luke and Jake, and, and Jesse was amazing when he was on the road. And he's a great dad. He's a great guitar player and an all-around good guy. I, I asked that question because I ask a lot of, um, most all of my uh, interviews, did Jesse, and even in this page, do your grandkids, do they understand what... Uh, what grandpa and dad does did. Oh yeah. Jesse, Jesse was, was a lot of fun to have on the road. So like when there were good tricks, he'd come to Australia, coast to coast with us in Europe. And I mean, he was in Russia. I mean, so he was very road wise. <laughs> Once we were staying at a um, hotel in LA and Billy Idol's people were there and, and my wife and one of the um, other ladies, you know, we were at Soundcheck or something, and Jesse's the protector of the women. And one of the Billy Idol people started flirting with, you know, with my wife and, and the uh, other guy. And one guy gets up to go to the bathroom. Now, Jesse's eight years old. And he walks over to the empty bar stool and he stares the other guy, eight years old. He stares the other guy in the eyes and, and starts brushing off the bar stool. He goes, what are you doing, little man? He goes, I'm brushing away the bullshit. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> Eight years old. He was classic. So uh, they gave him the no bullshit uh, um, badges and stuff. The, the crew guys really loved him. He was he was great. So uh, you know, probably the coolest kid you ever meet. Uh, I did a project with um, with Slash once, and uh, and and Slash would spend a half hour on the phone with Jesse, he's a little guy. You know, talking about uh, BMX racing, invited him to a Guns N' Roses show, took him backstage and showed him the cameras where all the girls were lifting their shirts and stuff. I mean, Jesse had a rock and roll life. I think that's so cool because, you know, when you think about it, when you, again, uh, uh, recapping, Jesse being your son, uh, Tori being Liberty's mm-hmm. uh, daughter, who was also the star mm-hmm. of uh, Chicago Med and good for her, and that's also right. to the fact of the matter of Alexa being Billy's daughter. And, uh, I mean, you talk mm-hmm. about a rock and roll lifestyle because, you know, my, my legacy comes from the Beach Boys. I've been working with them, uh, you know, from the mid-'80s on up and with Brian and, and then also, too, mm-hmm. with his daughters, uh, Wilson Phillips. So when you mention that whole situation of the um, of wanting to be uh, – to make another rubber sole or maybe even in that case make another Sgt. Pe- you know, Peppers and or a Pet Sounds, you know, it, it, it's mm-hmm. amazing how if you think about our career for Second Hair Russell – the fact is that we are still relevant. And I talk to a lot of young brothers and sisters out there, and I tell them that they've got to um, they got to expand their library, especially the millennials. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's more out there than uh, than uh, Ariana Grande and, and so on and so forth. To know where you're going is to know where the music started. 
You know, and so with that said, I have to ask you this question before we go into the Russia concert. But to this day, mm-hmm. if I was to hi- if I was to hijack your music library right now for Russell Jabbers, what are you listening to mm. currently? Hmm. I listen to well. I just got you know for my birthday, uh, my wife got me the big box set for the remastered Sergeant Pepper and all the books and right. all, the, all the other stuff. You know, so I just got that. Uh, I'm kind of in limbo. My music library is non-existent now because we're in the middle of uh, moving into a new place, and it's going and we've been out of it for months, and going to still be out of it for months more. So I'm living out of a suitcase. So, but I, I, stuff that I listen to, I'm a huge Randy Newman fans. Any old Randy Newman stuff, I love. Um, Steve Earle, I love. Um, you know, my taste in guitar players runs more to like I'm more of a Jimmy Bo- a Jimmy Vaughn fan than a Stevie Ray. Mm-hmm. Although I love Stevie Ray, but my sensibility is I love Steve Cropper. I love that kind of stuff. Right. Um, you know, I'm I'm kind of all over the place, but I don't listen to that much new stuff. You know, I I, I, yeah. I kind of go backwards a little bit. You know, I agree with you. You know. I have to ask a question, too, also as a musician, too, because, you know, going based upon the way the business was, the way the business is currently to you for the current stage of the Lords of 52nd Street, are you mm-hmm. being both me, you, and I say this as a compliment, but long in the tooth, is Russell more apt to being still biased to wedges on stage, or are you forced into the uh, inner ear situation for your monitors? Well, it's so funny you should say that, because, you know, we're old school, and I tried to inner ears a couple of times. But I'm wearing hearing aids now. I mean, I've got, you know, you know, um, I'm deaf and dumb. For people who don't know what it says. But, right um, <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I, I blew out a lot of my uh, high end anyway. So, you know, without the, without the hearing aids in, you know, it's a challenge for everybody that's talking to me. Mm. So, uh, uh, but, but, yeah, we're still using, uh, you know, wedges you know we're, you want you, know, you want to hear the ambient sound the of the audience yeah absolutely you know and and, and let's step mm-hmm. back to craziness let's step all the way back to back in the ussr i'm curious because that was absolute absolute debauchery just for the fact of the matter is i mean did russell javers have any um ill feelings or any trepidations by going over to a country that was under so much um unrest how frightening was that itself to be stared at by this well, mass audience? No, I mean, I was looking forward to it. My, my dad's uh, family was from, my, my mom's Italian, grew up in Little Italy. My dad's family was from Russia. Uh, so, although I never found out where in Russia, but, mm-hmm. and we had this thing when we were there where um, uh, a bunch of people in the party trying to tag along and, they set up a thing where there's, you know, where Jews are imprisoned and they call it refuse next. And mm-hmm. there's like a getting letters in and out is like a big deal. Supposedly keeps people alive. And so we did the fine novel thing and, and, you know, and I helped pass some letters along. Um, never thinking that, you know, I said, who's going to arrest me? You know, it's a, whatever, but apparently it was a little dicier than I understood. Right. But, um, you know, but yeah, it was, it was interesting. My wife and I made up these tapes because the music in Russia in those days was bootleg and that's all Mm -hmm. they got. So I didn't know if they would be familiar with everything. So we made up uh, in those days, cassettes of our favorite music. So every, you know, everything from, uh, you know, Aretha, natural woman and, and all these great hits. And, you know, I mean, just whatever my favorite stuff was, um, we put it and I met some musicians and some people there and they came to our hotel room and they put the earphones on and you'd see the tears coming. I mean, could you imagine hearing one after another, after another, just the most brilliant, unbelievable songs and records that you'd never heard before. It was like, it, it was overwhelming to them. Yeah. And then this one guy I met, um, was a Russian military guy. And it was it was talking to us, and I said, "Well, who are your favorite artists? Who do you know?" And he goes, "I love Bob Dylan, and I love Mark Knopfler." And I said, "Well, you're not going to believe it, but in my bag I have a, an album called Infidels, and it features both. It, it's a Dylan album, but Knopfler plays guitar on it. So 
I'm not allowed to give you anything, but just stand there and I'll slip it in your pocket. He goes, no, you can't do it. I said, don't worry, I can get another one. You'll, you know, you're not going to hear this. So I stuck it in his pocket and the guy showed up at the gig and he gave me his military, you know, his army uniform hat. And he goes, oh, I'll never forget. I said, really, it's nothing. You know, come on, I can get one of these. But, you know, so please take it. You know, it's not a big deal. But he was really moved, and he gave me his hat. And it was, you know, the people there, it was so funny. I said, this is, we went to Moscow, and it was like a, you know, it was horrible. You know, it was like everything was broken, nothing worked. Now it's a whole different place. Now it's, you know. But back then, it was like you said, this is what we were afraid of. You know, nothing worked. Nobody was motivated to do a good job. I mean, it was ridiculous. There was no food. There was no anything. And, uh, you, you know, so, it, it, but the people who, you know, and of course they love their culture and they, you know, and, and, and everything else, but they were the warmest, most open people. They would give us the shirts off of their backs. We met so many wonderful people that, you know, it, 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 it was very strange because, you know, I don't know if in those days, if we would have brought some people over from Russia, if they would have been as easily embraced in our world, you know, it's, you know it, 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 if people are, would have been as open-minded as they were and thrilled to meet us. So it was really interesting. I got a good Russia story for you. As we were waiting to go on stage, and there was a lot of press there, and it was like this was a big event, and everybody's covering it. And, you know, Billy's off to one side, and me and Liberty, everybody are getting ready to be ready to go on, and the lights go out. Somebody sticks a microphone in and says, this is a momentous occasion, and and what are you thinking before you're about to jump on stage? And Lib grabs the mic and goes, all right, you commies, let's boogie. <laughs> are you serious? Yeah, it was the best. You know, when I think I, of Russia, that's what I think of. You know, I, I and I and I, I'm questioning. I want to ask you this question too, because again, we talked about it before about hanging out with Liberty and hanging out with Richie and so on. How much fun? Mm-hmm. I mean, because I mean, people don't understand that aren't in this business. There's nothing glamorous. I've said this a thousand times. There's nothing glamorous about the road until the lights go up on stage. But my question mm-hmm. is, how much fucking fun was it to travel with Liberty and? Richie and oh. at the time Doug and so on. I mean, was it all about food and shooting the shit and everything else, uh, or you know, or what did you guys have? Were you guys it, under the thumb? No, we always, you know, we, you know, we were from before Billy, during and after. We always had fun, and you know, and Billy joined in. I mean, we would just, you know, the crew always loved hanging out with us because we always had a lot of fun, and and everybody, you know had a really good sense of humor, you know, so it was, uh, you know, even now, one of the nicest parts about being, uh, playing with Richie and, and, uh, Lib again, is all the shenanigans. I mean, we just clicked right back into all the nonsense and, you know, and it's never mean spirited, it's, but it's always a lot of fun, but oh my right. God, you know, Liberty, Liberty's house broken now, but he <sighs> was so hilarious and, and wild, you know, he was, uh, you know, there's a reason he's a famous rock and roll character. I mean, he's always a lot of fun to be around. You know, so. and you think about this for a second, Russell, and I, and I still blow myself out of the water because I'm a little bit younger than you, but I've, you know, I've been doing this since I was a kid. You know, I was, you know, I was mm-hmm. thrown into this industry when at the age of 19 years old, I started, I joined a group called the Tower of Power, who's actually celebrating 50 cool. years next year. And God uh, bless, you know, man. yeah, man, you know, and I mean, talk about being relevant, you know, Think about it, because when we're gone, when it's time for us to go home, think about how cool this is to be part of musical history. I mean, regardless yeah. of good, you know, a bad breakup or good breakups, you can't erase the memory of what you accomplished and what you contributed to the soul of Billy Joel, you know, and that whole that whole situation of, you know, looking back. I mean, I know there's times when I'm sitting in my studio and I'm blessed to look at the walls with golden platinum albums and so on. I think I'm not doing what I mm-hmm. really want to be doing, but I catch myself smiling because the bottom line is oh, like, when too. you think about it, you, it through, when, you, when, you, when you look at a certain album, I can throw myself right back into the studio and remember exactly mm-hmm. where I was, how long it was and what it took to, you know, to, put through, uh, to go through this. I mean, I don't know if you've ever had the chance to work with Brian Wilson, but I always tell everybody else you should have that one time mm-hmm. To spend a day in the studio with Brian, and and I want to ask that question, but just because of him being what the a, boss, what a genius! Yeah, well, yeah. a genius. Well, let's go back to Billy for a second. You know, on stage, this is let me just split this up two ways. On stage, did Billy allow you to be Russell? Did you did, were you um, 
did you were you scripted or could you step out of your wheelhouse and just go fucking bananas and play? Were you allowed to stretch on stage with Billy? Oh, we always, you know, we always uh, had fun. There, there was a time when um, we would open up with the stranger, and here's an example. And Liberty, you know, you could hear it on stage, but he, you know, Billy, you know, the lights would hit his hands and it would open up and he half close his eyes and pucker up to whistle. And Lib would try to get him to laugh so that he couldn't whistle. So Lib would start cursing at him on stage. Oh, fuck you. He goes, stop with you. look like an idiot. And he'd scream to get him to laugh, but it never happened. You know, so, and, and as his, uh, as the band would come in, his eyes would pass me because I stood next to Billy on stage, but Lib was on a rise behind me. So his eyes would pass me and go to Lib and then we'd come in. So one day I sent my uh, roadie out to get blackjack chewing gum. And I said, Lib, don't yell at him today. I'm going to get him. And I chewed up the gum on stage and I blacked out my front teeth. And, uh, you know, so he starts to, you know, he puckers up to whistle and there's no lip screaming at him. And as his eyes go past me to, you know, to, uh, to see Lib to come in, I smiled at him and my teeth are blacked out. And everything I stopped, but at all you hear, he couldn't whistle, and he goes, "Get that shit off your teeth!" And it ruined the whole beginning of the song, and he, and everybody's high fiving me on stage. We got him finally. So the next show, I go into his dressing room, which we didn't usually do, you know, before the show. We all had our own mm-hmm. space, and I have my mouth closed real tight, and I'm fixing my hair, and he's looking at me. He's all nervous. He goes, "What are you doing?" I said, "Nothing," you know, tight me. He goes. Get over here. He goes, open your mouth. Let the bit tell you. Nothing. I said, what? Two nights in a row, but I got him again the next night. It got so bad that even if I didn't do it, he couldn't do the song. So um, we had to drop it from the set. And the, and the label's calling up, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, you got to play that song, but we couldn't play it. He couldn't do it without laughing. So, so hey, we you know, had a lot of fun always. You know, and Russell, in the last minute of the show, and so, and damn it, I did. Mm-hmm. We've got to, I'm going to, I'm going to welcome back. I'm going to put that olive branch out itself. Please come back. We'll have our people talk to your people. And uh, I hate that term, um, but I want to get this uh, okay. scheduled. And because we're going to have a lot of legs to uh, the hired gun is the reason why you're here today. And guys go to the hired gun film.com mm-hmm. um, patronize this amazing, amazing documentary, which stars um, uh, mm-hmm. all the people that I've interviewed so far. And of course today with Mr. Russell Javers, Russell, you know what, man? I want to thank you so much, but I feel like I've known you forever. I've been a fan of your music forever. Thank you for uh, for oh, gracing you, my man. show and the network with this itself. And as soon as that this uh, this archives, uh, I'll send this to you. By all means, feel free to do what you'd like cool. to do, and I'll tag you back on Facebook and all the other social media sites. Cool. And um, the 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 listening audience worldwide right now is loving it. And uh, thank you for bringing this trifecta of Billy Joel's. Um, geniuses and you know to jackie's groove so with that said everybody i want everybody to say thank you and say goodbye to mr russell javers and you can uh, search the media search uh, facebook for russell patronize this man and everything this man does so with that said guys i love you brother thank you so much for uh, taking the time uh, out and, and sharing your story thanks guys man. jackie Bertoni, jackie's groove inner talk radio network here into all things music say goodbye mr russell javers thank you sir peace through music This is Jackie Bertoni from Jackie's Groove. Come join me weekly on my journey through the music business as I take you behind the velvet rope, interviewing industry notables such as Al DiMiola, Michael McDonald, and Al Jarreau, to name but a few. Listen to their stories on being in the studios recording number one hits and onto the stages throughout the globe. Allow me to be your music historian. You can hear me live every Monday at 2 p.m. and every Wednesday at 12 noon Pacific Standard Time or 24-7 on Jackie'sGroove.com. Ready to get your groove on? Hi, this is Tim Dolbear from Eclectica Studios. I'm a full-time mixing and recording engineer. I work with Grammy winners, labels, and indie artists using state-of-the-art digital mixing and restoration tools and the very best in analog gear. Really, though, it's my ability to bring tracks to life and fulfill your vision for your music. This has made me sought after by producers and artists worldwide. So spend your time working on music and not chasing a mix down a rabbit hole. Go to timdolbear.com and check out our free one one song mix offer. You know what's all around you every waking moment of your life? Marketing. You're choking on it. I'm Scott Robertson, and when it comes to strategic PR, branding, and marketing, I've seen it all. And actually, I'm still seeing it because bad marketing never sleeps. 
Join me each week on May the Best Brand Win right here on Intertalk Radio and learn how to make the marketing for your brand unforgettable. Are you serious about your music? Are you ready to run with the big dogs? The experts at Pitbull Audio have the gear to get you into the game. From leading manufacturers like Mesa Boogie, Fender, Pioneer, and American Audio. To sound your best, you need the best. Pitbull Audio can deliver in rehearsal, on stage, and into the big time. Dropping beats, shredding guitar, or making the crowd roar. Whatever you dream, Pitbull Audio can help make it happen. We are Pitbull Audio. We want you to play it loud. PitbullAudio.com. 